ジョイトズパッキャスト変革への道こんにちは伊藤浄一です今日のゲストはエミリー・ヤインです彼女は NFT 業界ではすごく最近有名になって、Pleaser DAO とか渋谷 XYZ というプロジェクトの代表です。Hey, Emily, thanks for being here today. And also thank you for joining the New Context Conference. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here.、Um, and have you, have you been to Tokyo before? So this is my second time.、Yeah. And the first time being April this year. Oh, what, 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 were, you, what were you doing here in April? Um, so, White Rabbit was playing on、oh, a bunch、right. of screens、yeah. in Shibuya Crossing, and I thought that I should see it in person. And because、yep. I've never been to Tokyo before, but it's always been on my bucket list. So, very cool. And, and we'll be linking to your talk at the New Context Conference, but what do you think about the conference and the people there? The conference is amazing. And I'm not just saying this, but it genuinely is the best.、Um, Well, most well organized conference I've ever been to.、Um, the only one that I can think of that's even remotely close was the Bloomberg Crypto Summit. And I think it really goes to show that、um, sort of the discipline that you know, Japanese culture and the employees have to、mm-hmm. just keep everything in order. I mean, it's reflecting in you know, public transportation and everything here, too.、Um, so that was super impressive. Thank you, Emily. I didn't pay her to do, say that.、Um, um, and Can you, for, well, you, and we'll have a link to your talk, but maybe for this audience, you can tell us a little bit about yourself. and... Sure. Yeah. So I am a digital artist and I used to work in the visual effects industry for six years. And then I lost my job, <laughs> which was unfortunate. And then I was unemployed for over a year. But thankfully, that led me to sort of tumbling down the rabbit hole of crypto. Was this during COVID? Yes, actually.、Um, so I had a, accepted an offer at Apple,、um, and I thought,、oh, my unemployment finally came to an end. And then the pandemic hit. And then, so I think it was a month later, they called me and said, just kidding, we're rescinding your offer.、Mm-hmm. Um, and then, so yeah, during this time, I was applying to a bunch of jobs, and I was looking for al- alternate ways to sort of make money and keep myself afloat because it's really expensive being in New York.、Mm-hmm. Um, and then, Yeah, so then I think this was around when summer of 2020 came along, DeFi sort of had a, a rise in activity. And then I was looking into it and I kind of just saw an opportunity to insert my own skill set and just carve out a little job for myself. And so I just started、um, doing these commissioned little animations for various different DeFi protocols. And then the rest is history. So, so when you went, When you say you went down the rabbit hole, you were sort of looking into Web3, you started playing with the tools and then like joining Discords and getting into the communities that. Yes. So I was introduced to the rabbit hole in 2017 and,、mm-hmm. you know, sort of just hovering on the edge. And I, I read about、um, the blockchain and everything. I found it fascinating. So、mm-hmm. I bought some crypto back then, but because I had a regular job still. So. Um, you know, it wasn't really sort of the main focus.、Mm-hmm. I do remember though calling my parents in 2017.、Mm-hmm. I was like, Mom, Dad, I discovered this new thing. It's called like crypto and I'm going to be rich. Like、mm-hmm. it's going to change my life. And then they were like, Oh, sounds kind of suspicious. And then 2018 happened when the、mm-hmm. crash came. And then, you know, not, not maliciously, they didn't know, but they would just, you know, call and check. So how's that crypto investment going for you? And then I would just be like, Oh, It's, it's fine. And then you know, let's just forget about it. And then, so, but I didn't sell anything. I put、yeah. it on the back burner.、Um, but then it wasn't until 2020 that I、mm-hmm. really was almost out of necessity and desperation, had to re approach the rabbit hole、mm-hmm. and really peer into it. And then、mm-hmm. when I looked in, I found really awesome cultures and、um, information and new、mm-hmm. paradigms of thinking. So、mm-hmm. I just jumped in, basically.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> And, and how did the Uniswap logo thing happen? Yeah, so、uh, around that time, DeFi was quite a small industry still. And so、um, I was kind of like a pinball, just bouncing between different DeFi protocols just through word of mouth. You know,、mm-hmm. I did one for Gurn Finance, and then Pickle came along and said, Can you make one for me? And then they posted on Twitter, and people liked it. And then Sushi asked me to do one, and then Ave, and then all of the DeFi protocols basically. So、mm-hmm. then, Um, I had kind of made a name for myself within DeFi about、mm-hmm. 
I'm Emily, the girl who makes cool little animations. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever they had an announcement or a new product launch or something, mm -hmm. I would read the white paper. And because it's so complex, actually, DeFi is really, really, you know, just complicated. Mm -hmm. um, just for myself to understand, I would read it first, try to understand it, and then come up with sort of visual metaphors um, to represent that. So it's easier for other people to um, ingest as mm -hmm. well. And then, yeah, around, I think it was January of 2021, mm -hmm. um, I got a message from Tarun Chitra, who is a good friend of mine in the space. He, I think, was close to the Uniswap team. And he mm -hmm. said, he messaged me and goes, hey, somebody from Uniswap reached out to me looking to connect with you. And they were wondering if you could make, um, uh, you know, work with them, basically. And then so I was like, yeah, obviously, you know, Uniswap at the time was the biggest mm -hmm. DeFi protocol, right? But it wasn't, it didn't stop there when they messaged me. They're like, yeah, so you know how we have V3 coming. I was like, I don't know, were you playing around with DeFi yeah, at the yeah. time? Everybody knew what a big deal mm -hmm. V3 was going to be. And then so I was like, really? You guys want me to do the V3 video? And mm -hmm. I think that's when I knew that it was going to be big. I didn't know how big mm -hmm. it was going to be, but um, I really sort of just at that moment seized the opportunity, put you know, sort of turned down any other opportunities to just focused on working on that animation for, it was, I think, two months that mm -hmm. I was working on that 40 second animation. Yeah. Wow, wow that's very cool. Um, and and so what year was that again? That uh, last year, so last 2021. Year, 2021. Yeah. And, um, and is that, was what's the relationship between that timing and Please or Dao and? Yeah, so, um, Basically, what happened was uh, when I made this very sort of psychedelic animation mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that nobody knows sort of what it means before I explained it anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's sort of the whole, you know, enigma of memes, right? Is mm -hmm. when somebody posts on the internet, I think the kind of reaction you want from people is, what in the world did I just watch? Mm -hmm. And then maybe they'll send it to their friends and be like, can you help me explain this or something? Mm -hmm. And then anyway. Um, so the video went really viral, obviously also because V3 was just so highly anticipated already. Mm -hmm. And uh, later that week, I also auctioned it off as an NFT because there, even though I had dabbled in NFTs in 2020, mm -hmm. I understood pretty quickly that you needed at least some kind of follower um, base mm -hmm. or just some fame to be selling NFTs. And so my goal really at the time was to sort of uh, build a brand name for myself until I got to the point where maybe I could comfortably just sell one or two art pieces as NFTs per month and mm -hmm. just make a living that way. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, around March of last year, you know, I was kind of like, I'm in my DeFi land and then I see NFTs becoming like bigger and bigger. I'm like, oh my gosh, a tsunami is coming. And mm -hmm. I was thinking, how do I also touch that wave? Mm -hmm. And so sort of like a one one stone, two bird effect. I auctioned the Unisop uh, animation off as an NFT thinking, oh, maybe there's a way that that will make me also known in the NFT space. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously I didn't know how big the tsunami was or sort of what happened <laughs> was an explosion. And mm -hmm. uh, really I could not have you know been here today without the support of basically my DeFi fans and mm -hmm. collaborators, you know, the early DeFi founders and all mm -hmm. those people just felt like compelled enough to come together, <laughs> form a DAO. You know, they're like giga brains at the time. Mm -hmm. They're thinking already light years ahead, right? Um, there's people who, you know, used to be like at Ethereum Foundation mm -hmm. that helped deploy the Pleaser DAO token and stuff. It was just, but in the beginning, it was just during the auction, some blatant um, from uh, who founded Pull Together had basically sent out a tweet saying, does anybody want to form a quick DAO to bid on this together? And then, you know, a bunch of people who sort of were admirers of my work in DeFi mm -hmm. uh, jump, all jumped in on a thread. They created a Telegram group. And then at first, because at the time I was auctioning off of Foundation, they didn't even support Gnosis Safe mm -hmm. yet. So um, they just kind of trusted each other and all sent um, each sent 10 ETH to somebody's wallet and then had that person bid on it. Mm -hmm. And then um, that's how Pleaser DAO was uh, born. <laughs> very cool. So, so Pleaser DAO was set up not by you, but by the, your, your followers, sort of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, 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 but, and you're people pleaser, right? How does that, yes. where does that come from? 
Yeah, so um, it basically comes from my personality type. During my unemployment phase, I created an art Instagram. And it's just kind of one of those tongue-in-cheek things where it's also my personality, but I want to please people with the art that I was making. To be honest, I, didn't, I wasn't in love with it at the time, but it was just one of those things where you make a temporary one and then I think, oh, no one's going to know. I'm all, mm. I'll just change it later. And then I didn't have time. Mm -hmm. So now it's kind of stuck. <laughs> and and, and, and what, what does Pleaser Dow do now? Uh, they just um, go around. Yeah. Do you know Katamari Damasi? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I would say Pleaser Dow is is literally that you know they just go around and they you know roll more people and assets into their giant ball of influence i uh -huh. guess is what they call it but they are um you know sort of they've been sort of only collecting up until this point but now uh -huh. they do actually have a core team of i think around 10 people that are working full-time in the mm -hmm. dow and then wow. they are sort of strategizing pro products and uh building um new tools and mm. they're coming out with stuff basically are you are you involved uh i am yeah um so you know every now and then mm -hmm. um i try to be a little bit more hands-off now especially mm -hmm. now that there's people who actually work you know in the beginning it was very grassrooted so it's just mm -hmm. whoever had time to mm -hmm. sort of contribute their ideas and opinions and obviously them using my name i was a little bit you know, I had to be invested or concerned, right? Yeah, because yeah. Um, I, it's, you know, sort of also in my interest that they do well or at yeah. least don't ruin my brand name. Yeah. Um, I'm joking, they're, they're doing a phenomenal <laughs> job. <laughs> um, but yes, so in the beginning it was more, oh, which was really cool to see, you know, just whoever um, is like enthusiastic about this can contribute their time and opinions and knowledge. And then now they're sort of moving towards a more established mm -hmm. structure. I, I, my my friend Sean Fanning, um, he created Napster, and that was his nickname. And he lost control of Napster, so it, it happens to people sometimes. It does. Yeah. Um, and then, so this you, now you're doing Shibuya, mm -hmm. and was does Shibuya come out of the Pleaser Dao thing, or is that a completely separate team? Oh, a completely separate. Yeah. yeah. So the Shibuya project is pretty much my passion project. Mm -hmm. So last year after, you know, Uniswap, Pleaser Dow, and then I did the fortune cover, um, I was just kind of looking for meaning within the space and thinking about what I should do next. And um, I've, I've just hadn't been one to, I think, settle. You know, it was definitely a, a, a sort of like a juncture where I could see a clear fork in the road where I could go down the path of, you know, maybe being like Beeple where I'm just mm -hmm. selling really expensive pieces of artwork mm -hmm. um or i could like launch a pfp project mm -hmm. <laughs> um neither of which seemed interesting to me and so this is where i sort of go rogue and then mm -hmm. swerve off like these paths and then try to make my own but shibuya ultimately is the culmination of a lot of the things that i learned at around that time right mm -hmm. so anywhere from my knowledge in crypto all the way dating back to my um experience working in post-production and mm -hmm. visual effects industry uh love for storytelling longer form narrative you know i think um the unisop piece coming out even though it was only 40 something seconds that sort of that feeling of knowing that my work really spoke to a lot of people mm -hmm. and made them feel something it's addictive mm -hmm. and you're like I want more of this. And I don't think selling, you know, like a five second loop animation mm -hmm. is sort of satiating that. And so selfishly, I think, how can I do this at scale? And I also did the crowdfund for the Ethereum documentary mm -hmm. uh, that summer as well, which kind of blew a lot of people's minds actually, because um, they were, so we sold basically a series of NFTs um, that I had made. Um, with the intention of raising for a budget for to mm -hmm. produce this documentary that was featuring Vitalik and you know um, and we raised over two million dollars in 48 hours so um, I think that was quite revolutionary at the time people just were like this never happens mm -hmm. um, and it also so that combined with uh, Pleaser Dow sort of these, this idea of collective ownership and mm -hmm. you know people coming together really sort of everything combined started got me thinking a lot more and then so i spent that summer just 
brainstorming a lot about what I should do next. And then, yeah, I think it was probably around September or October time where the idea of Shibuya first came to me. Mm -hmm. And um, then I started building from there. So I actually bought the tokens pretty early, I think. Oh my um, gosh, thank and, you. Uh, um, and I'm, I'm excited about the project, but like where, where is the project now in kind of like the, in its, in its cycle and where is it, where do you think it's heading? Yeah, so I, I think that we're at sort of like a inflection point right now. And we, we are sort of at the base of the curve mm -hmm. up because, well, first we just um, fundraised a little quiet seed round. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then also we are pretty close to finishing chapter three of White Rabbit, which I mean, I'm saying this myself, but it's honestly really good. Mm -hmm. um, and then just like with each new chapter, mm -hmm. um, because we sort of have more resources that can hire more people or, you know, make it just better each time. So it's exciting. And um, we are excited to sort of be onboarding new IPs as well so that people don't only have one show <laughs> to mm -hmm. watch. Mm -hmm. the, issue with that is obviously content is expensive time consuming to make and good content is uh surprisingly hard to find so i think this is definitely one of those things where um patience or delayed gratitude mm -hmm. will pay off as opposed to oh my gosh we need to onboard an ip now you know just for the sake of it like mm -hmm. i'd rather wait and find something that's good and i feel like people actually want to watch this mm -hmm. um and then you know just find the right partnership there mm-hmm very cool. Because I, I remember when it first came out. Um, well, because well, we were, we're here in Shibuya, and I work pretty closely with the mayor's office. And and I was, when I first saw it, I was going to show him because it was like, wait, but is this actually Shibuya? Wait, what is it? And I was confused. And I was like, well, I'll I'll wait and see. Um, and then because I was I was worried that he would have a concern because of the name. But then later, um, when he found out and he was like excited about it, it was I was really looking forward to you meeting the mayor of Shibuya and I, I what does it feel like actually being in I guess you've been to Japan and you've been to Shibuya but to be like connected to the Shibuya people I mean it feels surreal thank you so much for making that happen I um had my dream come true yesterday by making the meme photo with him <laughs> so and can we post it on the on the blog are you gonna well you have posted it I I, I I'll we'll post the okay. photo we'll put it right here really big <laughs> for everyone to see <laughs> um yeah it was a very sort of surreal moment where it's like she we are meeting she but exactly mm -hmm. i had that same concern i was like is he gonna be mad that i'm using the name mm -hmm. um but i think it just goes to show how forward thinking um and how cool mm -hmm. the japanese government and culture is you yeah. know i think it's a very just like web3 in general is a positive some mindset as opposed yeah. to um, zero sum. I won't. I won't name city names, but I can imagine other cities not being as excited if you did like some European city dot X Y Z. It said, "Hey, <laughs> yeah, absolutely." And it wouldn't be as cool anyway, or yeah, it wouldn't yeah. make sense. I don't yeah. think because well, the whole point is that it's you know sort of like all the screens that mm -hmm, are happening, mm -hmm. and you know people walk like all the traffic that goes by, and people just sort of glancing at the screen when something is interesting to you, you mm -hmm. kind of look at it longer. Um, yeah, and there's and, really only two places in the world that are like that, like basically. That. Yeah, and and Hasebisan, the mayor, is pretty cool anyway. I mean, he's formerly an ad agency guy, and he's you know grew up here, and he's um, easygoing. What, what was what was un, what was surprising actually was how excited he was. Like he was super stoked to meet you, and like oh my gosh, so that I'm was, so that honored. Was <laughs> that was neat. and and he. So when we were talking to him in the on the panel, um, I think it was the first time that um, he ever talked about that underground space, the space under the Shibuya crossing. And I, I'd heard rumors about it, but I'd never heard him talk about it in public. And one of the staff from his office was like, it's so cool, you got him to say it in public. So I think it was actually the like a first reveal. Wow, I feel very honored. Let's um, record that moment yeah. minted on the blockchain. We, we should, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, 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 and our, the community members in police or DAO and like do you, you were saying that um um that they help new artists and stuff like that like how does how does that work but if you were giving advice to a new nft artist uh, what, what will be the advice and and is please or DAO where they should go are there other DAOs that that do this well 
Yes, I think there are other DAOs that do this as well. On a small scale, I have a mini DAO with just two people <laughs> with me and Steve Aoki. Um, mm -hmm. Last year, we created the Please Aoki Vault where mm -hmm. we s auctioned off um, a piece that we made together at Sotheby's. And mm -hmm. then all of the proceeds, um, plus a little bit more of that each of us contributed or other people donated, mm -hmm are um, in this uh, Gnosis safe that we share now. And we use that to go, you know, sort of uh, purchase and su um, support emerging female artists. Mm -hmm. So I'm always on the hunt for any cool. unknown female artists. And then when I find one and it's a cool piece and we like, yeah. so we buy it. And then we also, you know, sort of tweet about it, um, amplify on socials to give them a little mini spotlight. I mean, mm -hmm. Steve probably has a lot more <laughs> traffic than I do, but. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's something that we do. Uh, I, I'm sure there are other DAOs that are doing this as well. Mm -hmm. It's funny because I think something that's really cool about Pleaser DAO, which maybe is a misconception, is a lot of people think I made Pleaser DAO or I orchestrated this whole thing, which you know, I wish I was like smart enough to do that or something. Um, but what's cool about it is that it was so serendipitous. Mm -hmm. And I think just like with um, the spread of memes, there's always that element of serendipity that is not in artificial control. Mm -hmm. I think that's what makes something so valuable and important. So um, it really loses the magic, for example, when people come to Pleaser Dow and then they're like, buy my work, or you know, they're hoping to be the one that's sort mm -hmm. of, but it, it needs to happen organically. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's the magic behind it, so, I think. So, so what's your advice to people who are doing new projects, I mean, just in general? Uh, well, I think you can go buy some incense and maybe like a Ouija board and then, <laughs> you know, just lay out your cards and pray and go to a tarot card reading or something and change your horoscope maybe. I'm joking. I mean, you know, with anything, right? Uh, what's that phrase that's very cheesy but true? Um, like luck is where oppor opportunity oh, is where luck yeah. meets hard work yeah. or something. Um, it really is that, you know, it's mm -hmm. like when I, when, you know, the Uniswap thing happened, sure, the whole Pleaser Dow thing was serendipitous, but it wasn't without hard work, right? Like I had all of these years that I had prepared and, you know, learned, uh, definitely brush up on your technical skills because mm -hmm. as an artist, you can't target your vision accurately or in a timely, efficient manner if you're just sort of you know, throwing darts at a board, right? Mm -hmm. Like you need to learn the technical skills first so that when you have a vision, you can execute it properly. And then when you get that part out of the way, then you need to have good ideas. Mm -hmm. And that comes from sort of just being a sponge and absorbing as much material and information as possible. This goes from anything can inspire you from nature, mm -hmm. quantum physics, you know, like just um, reading the newspaper, so many things, right? The more sort of knowledgeable you are, the more inspiration you'll be able to draw from. Mm -hmm. And then the last element is that one of luck and serendipity, mm -hmm. which unfortunately nobody can mm -hmm. control. But mm -hmm. when you have those first two parts, you're like 90% of the yeah. way there. And I, I feel like just watching you and looking at your work, I mean, you've also really captured the vibe. You know, it's not just sort of some art in the middle of nowhere. And I think that because I, I think, and that's the kind of interesting thing of like, there's certain, and we were talking to Sputnikko who comes from more of a, is, is at an art university. Um, but I, I feel like uh, uh, there's a whole set of NFTs that kind of very beautifully represent the community versus mm. NFTs that are kind of coming in with a completely new look. And I think they're both popular, but they, I think the people who collect them are pretty different, right? Yeah, totally. And there's not saying which one is right or which is mm -hmm. wrong, but yeah, I think my style is that my, my all of my work is pretty intentional. And so sort of life imitates art in the way where mm -hmm. I'm talking about um, the sort of opportunity is where uh, luck meets hard work. Mm -hmm. um, so real life examples of this would be like when the fortune cover um, opportunity came knocked on my door, I could literally have put anything on the cover. That was the deal. They were like, we just want your artwork on the cover. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think it was like, I had this opportunity. Okay, I have the skill set to make artwork of whatever I wanted. Mm -hmm. And, but what do I make the artwork of to maximize the effect of this, mm -hmm. right? And then so um, partially I have to credit also <laughs> Leighton again, um, I was having a conversation about this and he talked about, you know, sort of the idea of using memes or just, you know, drawing influence from influencers. And then we talked about 
well, you know, all these anonymous influencers on crypto Twitter and sort of just always my work is about capturing like a snapshot of this moment in time of what is happening with human behavior or on mm -hmm. crypto Twitter, this paradigm shift. And so uh, I just put all of the mm -hmm. sort of most well-known at the time crypto influencers with all their anonymous avatar profiles mm -hmm. on the cover. Um, and then, you know, in that way, it becomes a self-marketing machine. Yeah. Yeah. Like people get excited, they'll tweet about it. You, you don't have to do it. Yeah. It's just almost guaranteed that it's going to go viral, yeah. right? Um, and then when the Vogue Taiwan cover mm -hmm. uh, approached me as well, it was like, oh, another one of these mm -hmm. opportunities. But mm -hmm. I was like, what do I make the artwork of this time? Mm -hmm. And around that time, you know, there was like this whole meme of web two me versus web three me where mm -hmm. people post mm -hmm. your real photo. And, the, and so, you know, it was very intentional, but obviously because this is like a, like a fashion cover. So it's very different, you know, it has to be a little bit more serious. Like mm -hmm. it's not like fortune where I can just literally put a meme on there. Although that was also kind of out, out of the norm for fortune at the mm -hmm. time too. But, you know, sort of, yeah, using my skill set and then like my thinking of mm -hmm. like ideas and then targeting within the realm of what is being applied here for a more, you know, serious fashion cover. And, mm -hmm. um, but for the people who, you know, I think my work always strives to be like just visually when you look at it, it could be interesting. But when you think about the mm -hmm. meaning behind it, there's an extra layer to it, yeah. especially for the people who are in our culture or in this way of thinking, mm -hmm. they will, it will mean something to mm -hmm. them. So. Well, I, so I think you are pretty skilled and like like just even just thinking about turning the meeting with the mayor into a meme because it may or may not work but if you have to turn over those cards and i think if you're not looking for the opportunities um then you're never taking those shots on goal you know and i think unless you understand the language you don't even know where the opportunities are you know and i think that's that's pretty amazing how you you're able to kind of twist each opportunity into an interesting way. Thank you. I think I'm quite unhinged at this point. It's like, <laughs> I can't help it. You know, my brain is just broken and uh, somebody needs to stop me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think people, yeah, and, and, it, and it's hard because I think if you plan everything or if you structure everything, um, you don't get lucky, right? Mm -hmm. Because luck is about sort of unplanned things. And it's and then that's the tricky thing. We were talking about how everything is organized. But one of the problems with Japan is everything is so organized and everything is so by the book that serendipity becomes less likely. And it's only some weird people in society who feel like they have um, permission to be unusual. But most Japanese don't feel like they have that. And even in art schools, a lot of times you're just told exactly what to do, you know, and and it's kind of dis, you know, dis difficult. I mean, I'm sure you know better than I do, but I actually disagree. Um, so I was at, at dinner yesterday, I was yeah. explaining, you know, somebody was asking me, what do you love about Japan? Like, why do you like coming here mm -hmm. so much? And I said, it's, it's, it's the contrast of structure and order and mm -hmm. everything, but then the chaos of sort mm -hmm. of the culture and, you know, anything creative in, Japan. So when you watch a commercial, yeah. literally any commercial is just super ridiculous and over the top. They're always sort of yeah. unintentionally become memes because just Western people are just like, who thinks of this stuff? Mm -hmm. And this is hilarious, ridiculous. And I love that about Japan. But then when you walk out on the street, people are so sort of polite and serious and everything mm -hmm. is orderly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think a society that has that contrast mm -hmm. is what makes it so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that definitely the rest of the world notices this as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's not just that people in Japan are only living within a grid, you know? Well, so yeah, so I think I think the contrast is pretty intentional. So I think that certain artists and certain jobs allow you to be unhinged. And those people are kind of like, but it's, it's, it's kind of, it's interesting because it's done in a fairly organized way. So like, I remember um, I was walking in Harajuku once and there was a guy with a, a mohawk and um and a fuck off and die button <clears throat> and i bumped into him and he's oh excuse me i'm sorry excuse me <laughs> and, and so there's a lot of this kind of unhingedness that's allowed because people feel comfortable that it's done within a certain set of rules right mm -hmm. so so you know like television commercials there's a it's kind of a form you know and it's like kabuki theater right and and they know when somebody has a fuck off and die button most of those kids aren't serious about it and so it's kind of permitted and and i think that a lot of um a lot of artists also get to do that. And there isn't the same kind of moral majority thing. Like people know that it's kind of a joke. And and I think that's that's a, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's interesting because as you point out, I think like Japan 
Japanese feel they're very uncreative, but when you look at the products, um, people think that Japanese are creative, and they get here and they wonder where is that, you know. And, and mm. I think it's a, it's just, it's a very different structure. Yeah. yeah. So you're doing um, Shibuya. So what's is there anything that I can ask about what's next? Well, I definitely chapter three is coming out uh, mm -hmm. hopefully in December. Okay. And I think it the sort of voting mechanic in this one is going to be vastly, vastly different from the first two chapters. So okay. that's really exciting. And um, probably early next year, we'll see some announcements of uh, new IPs that we've mm -hmm. been speaking with. So they, they're going to show up in the story, the other IP? The other IPs? Or are they separate new stories? New stories, yeah. Um, so White Rabbit is still going to be ongoing, but mm -hmm. there will be new stories oh, in Shibuya. Yeah. So it's kind of like right now, the Shibuya crossing is... There's one screen, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just playing White Rabbit. All the other screens mm -hmm. are, are sort of loading. Yeah, <laughs> and there yeah. will be hopefully a few more screens that light up um, right. early next year. And uh, I, I'm I'm excited to announce the um, the fundraise um, mm -hmm. soon. We I like to do this really obnoxious thing instead of doing a tweet storm or you know even like a poster of an mm -hmm. announcement of a fundraise. I literally go out of my way to make a video. <laughs> like oh, an cool. animation of it. Mm -hmm. um, so um, yeah, I hope that's, that's gonna be that's, that's excellent. cool. It's currently in progress. I think it's gonna be sick. So mm -hmm. people should watch it. Um, and we're gonna make a uh, behind the scenes featurette of mm -hmm. um, sort of all the animation and what we've done in White Rabbit so far. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, I very much look forward to it. And, uh, <laughs> thank you. Th thank you for coming, Emily. And hope you come back soon. Thank you for having me. I love Japan and Joey. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot.